All right. So um, this week we're going to cover chapter six, which is all about workflow. It's, um, as I mentioned a, a second ago, it's a pretty short chapter, but there there are a couple of, I think, uh, pretty, there are, she's my, uh, my Siri keeps wanting to talk to me. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a pretty short chapter, but there are a couple pretty important concepts that, um, in the short, short time that I've been with, been with our, um, have learned to be very important. So I, you know, just my background, uh, very quickly, I, I'm new to R. I, I've, I've been, um, working with R for literally six weeks and no longer, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm in a master's program at the university of Notre Dame. So I've had to do quite a lot with it already. Um, and then I started in on this book club right from the beginning so that I could uh, learn it. Uh, the other thing that I did to sort of enhance my learning is is uh, at Notre Dame, we have a Tidy Tuesday that we meet every Tuesday. Um, and we do the Tidy Tuesday from the week before. It's a really helpful kind of uh, thing to join because you get to see people's thought process and working through R and analyzing data. So everybody is encouraged to come to that Tidy Tuesday on um, and you can find the link in the in the uh, uh, Slack. So, but uh, so um, getting to the chapter here um, again, we're going to talk about workflows and projects and how to manage. And I'm going to be flipping between these slides and and my R environment here. I would say the from my perspective, these are the two most important concepts and these these might be obvious to to folks that have even been working with R for a few weeks but it's really important to understand and manage your session and it's important to understand and manage your working directory these are the number one and two problems that the students that i've been working with in my classmates have run into week after week when they're trying to do the week's homework that we have or the week's project that we have that their working directory gets messed up their session gets mixed up and it's really easy to do so uh we'll talk a little bit about what that what that all means and how to how to manage it um i sort of started from the beginning managing it a very specific way and i haven't had any problem with it but trust me people have problem with it all the <laughs> like every week <laughs> so, um so that's really what we're going to talk about is is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about script diagnostics and a little bit about the some of the R Studio things here. But I, I think directory and session are are critical. So the first thing is when you're in in R, you you can run a script, and this is where um, you can you can execute commands and save them in a script so that you can execute them later. So what, what we're talking about here is the difference between going to new file and creating an R script and typing in your commands here versus just typing your commands down here in the console, right? So if I do three plus four, just something trivial, I can do that, right? And I get seven. But if I do it up here, I can get the exact same thing three plus four, and then when I execute it, it actually just copies that line down into the console and executes it. But the advantages of doing it up here in, a, in an R script is that you now have it. So if you're playing around with different things, you can save that and then you can come back to it anytime you want and see what you did and you know look it over. Because down here in the console, once you run it, it's gone, right? Gone, gone for good. So, so running, I, I think it's pretty common to, to create a R script where you do a lot of your kind of playing around with different commands and analysis that you might do before you, before you maybe use a markdown file to then create something a little more formal or describe, describe your work. It's common to play around in an R script first. Um, and yeah, this just tells you how to get there, you know, new file or there's some uh, uh, commands to do it, um, and then save your file. Um, it shows up again in this top left panel by pane by default. Um, 
like I said, a lot of the stuff in here is real, real straightforward. Um, this is just talking about how in our studio you can manage your pane layout. So you'll notice up here in the top, top left, I have my my files that I'm working with, whether these are scripts or or my markdown files over here. I got my environment and other things. I have down here in the bottom right, I have where I can see the files in my folder and my current project and the help window and variety of other things down here is my console. This is the default layout and it's the layout that I kind of like, but if you want to modify that, you can. So you maybe you want to put the console over here on the right. So you can just go to this little icon up here and decide whether you want your console on the right, for instance, or back on the left. And it just swaps those two panes. You can then go to pane layout and go nuts if you'd like, right? So you can decide each of those four panes what you want in those panes. So you can really uh, go wild and set up whatever, you know, whatever layout you want. I think the default layout works pretty well for me. Um, but that's, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Here's a couple quick commands to change your focus to to the uh, the script or the console right so for instance i'm here in the in my script and if i do command two or command one command one is going to take me to the different different panels by default so that's all that does any questions so far panes layout <laughs> as i said pretty straightforward stuff but Okay, when you're when you're in a script to to run this, um, you can just put your cursor after after a command, and hit hit um, hit command on the Mac. You hit command and hit enter, and then it'll run whatever command your cursor's at. And um, that's all this says: command enter to run the current expression in the in the console, and then the cursor moves to the next block. So you can do that one at a time. So you could go like, you know, you can go run run this and then run this and then run this. So all I'm doing there is hitting command enter each time. You can also select a group of commands and hit command enter and then I'll run all of those. Um, that's all this is saying. Um, You'll need to have your libraries loaded, right? So don't don't forget when you start a new session, and we'll talk about sessions here in a minute, that becomes really important. You'll wanna make sure you have your libraries loaded with these library commands. Generally inside scripts or inside markups, you, you don't do your install commands. Most people would do their install commands down here in the console because you only need to load them once and you don't wanna re, you know, you don't, need to rerun those every time that you go in to do some work, right? So install packages is something you generally do once or you do it to upgrade a package if you know a new version's come out or you wanna make sure you got the latest. But library is the command that loads it for that particular script or QMD or whatever. Any questions? Okay, I I have a question. I don't know if yeah. you can hear me. I there is a package manager that I normally use, Pacman. Oh. And the way I normally write it is that the first line is that if if it is not installed on the system, that it should it should install it. Then it will now it's a kind of I don't know if you know about it. You don't need to, if a package is not installed, it will automatically install it and load it. So okay. there won't be any need for library, to use library. Once you use it there, you can put all your packages just separated by comma. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I'm not, about, I, Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So what I'm asking now is that the way I normally write it, the install dot packages will be there on the first line. I don't know whether it is a good thing to do or not. Yeah, I mean, I don't know for sure. Um, and we can have other people weigh in as well. But I, what what we were told is that in general, um, you don't 
you know, just load the packages you need. And otherwise, you know, if like you may, you don't need to load a whole bunch or, or do library or these kind of things with a whole bunch of packages that you've used for across a whole dozens of scripts, right? It's so generally people, people just load the one or two packages that they need for a given script or a markdown rather than kind of having it loaded by default. That's my impression, right? But um, maybe some people do some sort of default loading. I'm not sure. Uh, Actually, it's not, a, it's not a default loading. It's a way of you load all the packages you need, but you don't need to load them separately. Okay. You only put them in, then you separate them by comma. I see. So you don't need to put library, library, library. Okay. You understand? So I don't know, but I'm done. When I was going through this chapter before yeah. this class, I now saw that it's not good to put in stored up packages. But where I picked that from, it was a kind of okay to make your code neater and not right. to be repetitive with library. So it's yeah. like a kind of conflicting something. So I don't know which one is right or wrong. Yeah, I think like when I create, when I do mine, I always have a, I think it becomes important when you think about doing a markdown where you're going to share this with other people, right? Because generally like your R script is something that just you are going to use, right? And so however you want to manage it in your R script, I think is sort of up to you, right? It doesn't matter too much, mm -hmm. but I think it becomes important when you when you start thinking about creating a markdown file that you might publish or or share with other people because in fact you can't you can't even put a install packages in a markdown block that will error out and that's important because when you share this with someone else you don't want you don't want it to install packages on their system, right? <laughs> that should be something they should do if they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so when I create a markdown, I always always start with a an individual markdown block mm -hmm. that has my two to four or five packages that the script's going to use. And then that way, the person that receives my markdown knows what libraries are being used. Mm -hmm. It's real explicit. And they can install whatever, whatever they want to, right? And another practice around that is you can put a comment above this, something like this, where you say, you know, you may need to, you may need to install, you know, to run, install packages for each one that you have. And that way, when you're communicating to a third party about what they're going to need to install, they can make those choices or not. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's how I would approach it. I don't anybody else have comments about sort of managing library and packages and oh. and I always put a uh like I said, I always put a um I put I put this block that has my package loading all on its own at the top and then I put warnings equal to false or output equal to false or something so that you don't get like this kind of nonsense in your, in your markdown, <laughs> but cause uh, you know, you don't need to see that in, in, in your markdown. And I usually, I usually cold code fold, fold that one. Right. I know this is getting sort of beyond what uh, the chapter is all about, but, and then I usually code code fold this, this block. I think that even that one guy said, well, you can on that chunk, there is a way you can do this setting that it will that the one is will not come out. Say that again. I say on the chunk, on the yeah. markdown chunk. Uh-huh. I say way you can do this setting that the one is will not come out. You don't need to write it explicitly. You know that where that button that they used to run it, the setting, yeah. the other button. I say, way well, you can turn the messages to equals false or something. Huh. I can't really remember that automatically the one is will not come out. Okay. All right. All right. Let's um, let's get back to our slides and see what else we got. 
So this is just talking about diagnostics and and errors that will show as you're writing code. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Like most IDEs, when when you write code that doesn't make sense, the ID ID usually looks ahead and gives you some some warnings or some suggestions, and you can hover over those those problems. It has a little squiggly there, and when you hover over it, it tells you like where your problem is. That's all we're talking about on this slide. <laughs> pretty pretty straightforward if you've done any any sort of programming or an, used an IDE of any sort. Any questions on that? That's like the all we have to say about diagnostics. <laughs> a really comprehensive dive into our studio diagnostics. <laughs> yeah, I, I just have a, a comment about um, the presentations. I knew earlier on, um, Dewey had mentioned that uh, we can always get these on um, Slack, right? Yeah. Where you showed us on Slack. Okay, basically. I thought you had yeah. to create that if you had to lead a discussion on your own. No, no, no. You can always, those are always there right here under book bookmarks. You can go go to that right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. you can go to that anytime you want. You can look at next week's. You can read ahead. Yeah. These oh, are very okay. useful. I, li I like these slides a lot. They're, they're pretty succinct, and so they're worthwhile. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right, so the next thing they want to talk about is file naming. Um, and they're just talking about making sure that these are machine readable and are human readable and they they default order there's there's uh it's just about creating a file structure on your file system that makes sense when you look at it that sorts in a in a way that makes sense whether that's zero through four like this or some dates using year month day notation for consistency um and that's all this is about because if you have if you have a file system that where it's just willy nilly in terms of how these are named, you will thank us later because you know two years from now you look in a file try to find that one thing you're looking for and it's just buried in a you know in a directory full of files. I mean, this isn't our specific so much as it is just uh, good file system management, I, frankly, um, but. Um, and I think Colin gave us this link a few weeks ago that if you go to this link and I'll, I'll put it here on in the in the chat. This is a great little um, I think it's a, a grand total of five minutes. Um, recommend you watch it. It she does a really good job of explaining uh, what you ought to do with files and why it's a, it's a good little video to watch. And it, you can get to it from here too, but, and then there's a couple other links to get even more about file naming if you want to uh, dive into that topic. Any questions about file naming? No. All right. So the, the next slide again gets to what I think is really the critical thing is, is has to do with how sessions are managed in studio and how projects are managed. And this gets to, um, what happens when you do some work in our studio, then you leave and you come back to it in a, in a day and you start start your work again. Um, is What state is everything in? And how do you know that your variables are in the right state that you want them in? They're at sort of a beginning state versus some state that might be not what you want. As an example, let me tell you sort of to give you an idea of what I mean like so if you look at this if you look at this line of code I just load um, this excel file into a uh, data frame right and it has you can look at it here right but I might be playing around and doing something here where I take this data frame and I modify it right where I say something like, um, pipe that into mutate, and you know, or let's just do a select. I only want the for for some some analysis I'm doing. I just want 
model year and division, something like that, right? And then, and during my work here, I do, I run this. And now you'll notice that my, because of the way I did this, right? I put this, I reassigned it to itself instead of creating a new data frame. Oh, is the sound, sound was uh, cutting out for you, Milo? Yeah. Is yeah, it still doing? Trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> it okay. was um, when you were talking about that link with the video, but it's it's been fine since. I just want to make sure that just in case it was happening to other people. But okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah. Keep me keep me posted. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you, you bet. Yeah. So, so I I did this to illustrate what problem you can run into, right? So if if I feed this guide back into itself, now you know my environmental variable guide to cars df is different than what it was when I loaded, right? And if I came back to this a couple days later, well, thinking that, that this data frame is the full data frame that was loaded and I forgot that I had done that and I go down here to work with it later or something, you know, I've modified an environment variable that sticks around if I, if I don't manage this, sticks around in the session and then it may confuse me later. You know, you might you might have a bug when you're writing code that modifies the data frame or a variable in a way that you didn't expect. And then when you come back to it, you sort of are, you know, perplexed by the fact that it was a bug that happened before, right? So this is why uh, this concept of session is so important. When, when you're working in R, you create a session that manages the variables that are there and the current state of things. And so it's important to know, it's important to know that. It's important to know how you got into R and what the status of the session is and make sure you clear things when you need to so you know kind of your starting point. And a good way to, one good way to ensure that, like, for instance, maybe I wanted to go back and say, no, I want to clean this up and get back the original. I can either just rerun that, right? Or if I wanted to, I could also use this little broom here that clears all the objects for me and gives me a, a clean starting state from a from a object standpoint. So a couple good good little tips there with this broom to clear objects out of your workspace. Um, or you could rerun, you know, your initial, but there's a lot of ways to manage that. And then one uh, one option, this was the very first option that our instructors told us on day one of working with R. They said, you need to go into global settings, go to workspace, uncheck this restore data at startup, and never save it when you exit. Because this is a sure way to confuse your, you session to session, right? Confuse yourself each day that you go in to work with R. So in general, this is a this is considered a best practice is to have these this workspace area in this set setting unchecked and never hit apply. And that way you're not storing any bugs that you might have made or data that you might have just been playing around with. You got a clean slate when you come back to R the next time. So it's a really good idea. Um, I, I I had a quick question. Uh, sure. So if if I don't uncheck that, does that mean like if I have a library loaded, the next time when I come back, the library is still loaded? Or yeah, you know, I have to I have to admit I haven't tested the exact limits of what all what what all is cleared and what all is state saved. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so I don't know the full answer to that, frankly. Okay. Uh, okay. I just know that. It seems to me from from my professors and these slides that not saving this stuff is best practice so that you don't confuse yourselves in ter in terms of what's loaded and what's not. Mm -hmm. And cuz and in general when you go to work in a session you're going to want to run your library commands as you get started. And I know it's a it's a step that you got to do but it takes like 2 seconds, right? To select yeah, yeah. those babies and run them and you're good to go. So <laughs> so I think that's every time I sit down to R, I I make sure I got the libraries I need and I run them. 
and that, then yeah. that takes that off the plate, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense, yeah. And it, I think it's just a way of explicitly knowing what you got and what you're working with so you don't mm -hmm. get confused. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so they highlight that exact, this is, again, this is almost, this is exactly what our professors told us on day one too. So I was, I was, I was uh, surprised or it was, it was nice to see that, that consistency. There's a, there's another way you can reset your session. So you can also do this, um, command shift zero. And so you can do command shift zero and you'll see that it says restarting R. And so that clears everything and gives you a clean slate, right? So let me run these again. So if I run those and you can see now in my uh, environment pane, where are my variables? Well, I didn't get it because I didn't run my libraries, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so in my environment pane here, right, I, I ran those few things, but then if I do command shift zero, it's gonna restart everything, give me a clean slate. So this is another way, this is, I think that's a really good kind of troubleshooting step. If you've been troubleshooting some complex code where you've got some variables that are in a state that you don't want them in anyway, because it was a result of an error or whatever, running command shift zero, and starting from the beginning is a good way to say, okay, I know I'm at a clean state and there's nothing hanging around that is gonna cause me trouble. So that's what that's all about. Um, I mentioned command enter to, to run line at a time. You can also either do it from up here with source, which will run the whole thing, or you can do, there's there are different commands, command shift S, which will run the whole thing that runs the whole whole shebang. So a lot of ways, a lot of little shortcuts and all this kind of stuff to, to manage this. I wanna talk a little bit about sessions because if, if you do end up using QMD files, right? Uh, which you probably will, or marked, markdown files to share with things. Um, when you render a markdown file, that rendering is done in its own session, distinct from this session that we're using for R. So in other words, if I go to my markdown here, and you can see I created this data frame from the R session or from the console, I created this data frame, right? And it's in my environment. But if I go and try to use that by doing this command, inside my markdown, say I put that there and I hit run. I hit run and it's gonna work because it's using the environment session. But if I go to render it, it's not going to work because when you render it, it creates a brand new clean session because the whole purpose of rendering it is you're gonna share this with somebody and you gotta make sure that everything that you need for that thing to run independently has been declared. And a whole bunch of stuff doesn't work because I didn't put in my libraries. I didn't load the data frame. I, you know, I didn't, you can't just, I see, I see students in my class do this all the time. They, they come in here and they, they play around with some stuff and they're like, oh yeah, so, you know, this is, this is the dude I'm going to need for my, my homework assignment. So I'm going to copy it in there and then, and they copy it in there and then, then they're confused that it doesn't work. Well, it's, it doesn't work because they didn't include the library. They didn't include the loading of the data frame and they're looking at it here and it, and the, the, the errors, the error might say, well, this says could not find function. That's because the libraries weren't loaded. So maybe they figure that out and they put the libraries in there. Right. And now they try to, now they try to render it. And now it says guide to cars, DF not found. And this can be really perplexing to people because they're like, how can it be, not be found? It's right there. I can see it right there up in my environment pane. How can it not be found? Right? And that's because the QMD rendering uses its own session. 
that's independent of your environment session. If, if I execute just this blurb, it actually works. Because the blurb, you know, these code blocks, when you're just using them like this, just to check and test, uses the environment session. But when I render, it does a brand new clean session. Big point of confusion by folks. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you've ever done some of this where you've been executing code blocks or rendering Markdown and you're like, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, this is why. Any questions about that? I have a question, DB. I, I, I remember when I got introduced to R, uh, even though I, I didn't use it consistently a while ago, I I don't think quarter was around. I used to write about R Markdown. Yeah. R Markdown, R Markdown. So what's the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So um so what you're talking about is an R Markdown or R notebook, R Markdown notebook versus a quarto document. Basically, the the quarto document is a markdown document that's just like R Markdown, but a lot better. So I don't know all the ways that it's better, but our professors have emphasized that um, the reason why Quarto is now at the top of the menu above our markdown is everybody is moving to Quarto markdowns instead of our markdown. It's yeah, exactly. Uh, Daniel says it's like Markdown 2.0. That's right. It's just a a better version of our markdown that has more features and everybody's moving to it. So. Um, so I definitely would recommend if you're doing markdown files, stick with a Quarto document or instead of a, the old R markdown, because that's what everyone's moving to. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and it in our class, not that that matters too much, but in our class, that's how we submit our homework is using uh, R markdown outputs. So, yeah. Um, so, so again, that's, that's that's the session confusion that often comes up just to reiterate that it'll it can look like it's up here but it's not in your court in your render session and and it can confuse you because a lot of people what a lot of people do is they come into an r script and they play around they kind of try out a bunch of different stuff and then they want to create the shareable document using a quarto and then they cut and paste stuff that they did here because they know it works but they didn't you know make it all good. Yeah, no, I it's not it's not for a different purpose. It's just like uh the older version older version of a, a quarto notebook. An R notebook. So it's essentially the same thing, just a uh, older version. So uh, like for me in the six week I've been I I haven't touched these menu commands at all. I just use a quarto document and call it good. You know, create create new quarto document decide what my output is, yada, yada. So, I don't know if there's any reason why you would, would use an R notebook at this point. I don't think so. Especially if you're just starting out, out with, uh, with R, yeah, go with Corta. Any other questions? Okay. So, so the, the next part of management and again this gets back to what i think are the two biggest takeaways manage your session we just talked all about that and how that can be confusing the second part is managing your working directory because it won't be long like your first time you want to really do some data analysis where you're going to have some external files whether it's a csv or an excel file or whatever that you want to import in to use in your analysis. And then you're gonna wanna and create a, a shareable markdown file, for instance, and maybe you got images that you wanna put in there or other kind of external resources that you want to, to, to include in your analysis or in your output, right? So this, again, this is what I would call the number two problem that comes up every week with, with the you know 40 or so classmates that I have is, they haven't managed their working directory. 
such that it's pointing to a different working directory and they now can't find the Excel file. And in general, when you want to share something, it's best to have your references be, be uh, relative references like this instead of absolute references, right? Instead of saying, so you can see here, I'm in home, desktop, indie, data science, book club, chapter six. Instead of this saying, read Excel, home, desktop, indie, science, RD, book club, chapter six, and then the name, I just put the name of the file and I ensure that I'm in the folder that I'm working. This is, this is generally how you want to do it. Use a straight relative path this way rather than an absolute path. Because otherwise, when you share it, people are going to have to mess around with paths, right? To actually use your code as is. So relative paths are the way to go for almost all purposes is rel relative path paths. Uh, sorry, do I yeah. like to make a, a comment on this? Yeah, you bet. Um, I usually work with a, with a lot of... Uh, files and especially a lot of notebooks yeah and i i was always uh, i mean inside my uh, working directory i have like uh, directories for raw data process data etc but mm -hmm. my notebooks were always uh, all together inside the working directory so i have right. process data raw data and all my notebooks uh, because uh, if you put the notebooks in a subfolder, uh, then the working directory some way changes. But I found a very interesting uh, package called here, yeah, which basically allows you to create, for example, a folder called notebooks, and which you run here, your working directory will be still your working directory and not the yep. directory directly where your quarto notebooks are so that was interesting for me i discovered it like two weeks ago and that saved my life or <laughs> saved my, that a lot of time this package here you know we got a whole slide on it that one yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'll come back to you and we'll we'll talk about that slide <laughs> and and you can you can tell us more about your experience with it yeah because i i i definitely haven't had to deal with it yet too much because mm -hmm. i I've had fairly simple projects just for homeworks and such. And so I've, mm -hmm. yeah, so I've just managed it, but it, but it, it's definitely important to early on develop a strategy for how you're going to manage your folders, because if you don't and you just let it happen, however, it ends up happening, your folders are going to be all over the place and your working directories are going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. And every time you try to load something, it's going to say, can't find it because it thinks the working directory is one thing and that's not where you put the thing <laughs> right? or, you say, or you save things and you don't know where oh yeah you don't know where you <laughs> saved it cetera, yeah. yeah so so for me what what i've gotten into the habit of doing is the when i go to do really anything in r i start out by so far i've been putting it all in in d data science because that's kind of the program i'm in but you can see here i created an rds book club folder and like today or yesterday when i prepared for this i created a folder called chapter six <laughs> so anything that i wanted to do for for this presentation is in my chapter six folder and i don't have to worry about paths right and another common way to manage that is through the uses use of projects. So again, I what I typically do, so here, here's what I would do if I was going to create something for next week. For instance, I would say chapter seven, and I'd create my folder, I'm gonna say that's gonna be my chapter seven directory. And then I would start by doing new project. And I would say existing directory, I'd browse to my chapter seven, and I'd open it, and I'd create my project and now I got a nice clean slate. Anytime I want to come back to this, I can open that project file because it creates a project file here within this directory. Whenever I want to come back to this, I can open up that project file and I have all my files there. They're referenced appropriately. I don't have to worry about file paths, anything like this. And so this is kind of how I work, right? 
if if I need to go back to chapter three because I want to see, hey, what what do we do in chapter three? I can go to chapter three, load up my our project, and I don't have to worry that any of the code I wrote and the files that I use. Obviously, this is pretty simple. Let me show you something a little more. <laughs> uh, like if you look at some of my homeworks, for instance, right? I can go. I can go back to week week three, and I can open up my my week three project that I did for my classes. And there I am, I got all the files I need. I don't have to worry that if I come in here and I try to load up my homework that I did weeks ago, I don't have to worry that this, this stuff isn't gonna run because it's gonna run because the project stored the working directory and knows, knows everything that it knew last time I was in here, <laughs> right? So I think projects are a great way to, to work uh, because it organizes. So I, I have a very low low tolerance for creating a new project. As you can see here, I create a new project for book club chapter six. <laughs> and again, it just helps me manage my files and helps it make so that I can say, hey, I remember a few weeks ago, we covered something around this. Then I can just go to that week, open up the project and and sort of very quickly get to where I lit left off instead of having to go through a bunch of rigmarole, right, with files. So highly recommend you think about projects and organize it. You got to figure out what works for you. As you mentioned, you know, you you uh, you like your certain files organized certain in folders, and that's all good. But even there, you would you would be using relative paths, right, because you would be saying load the Excel instead of here where I'm saying, uh, you know, load Excel wherever I do that, load guide to cars, Excel, yours would say, you know, data slash guide to cells. And that's going to work for everyone. It's still a relative path. It's not a, an absolute path from your C drive or something like this, right? So that's all perfectly fine if you want that kind of folder structure. And some people, some people like it. And as you get complex projects, you're probably going to have more structure than not, right? I think that that was sort of your takeaway, right? Any any other comments about about that? There are commands for managing this, right? There's git working directory, set working directory. But I, I took the 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 uh contention from the beginning is I don't want to ever have to use these commands <laughs> unless like <laughs> unless I, I don't set up my my structures right. I hope to never have to use these commands <laughs> by and large, right? So if you find yourself using git working directory and set working directory a lot, you might rethink your file management strategy. That's I think is what my recommendation would be. And it, I know I say these things like I've been doing this for a long, I've been doing this for six weeks, guys. So it's, <laughs> it is just, you know, my limited experience, but um, yeah. Any, any other comments about those file systems stuff? No? Okay. And then projects, this talks about what we just talked about with projects. There's uh there's a nice, uh, workflow um, information here from Jenny Bryan again about project-oriented workflows. I recommend you check that out. I described already and showed you how to create a new project. Um, nothing, nothing really new on that slide. This is the idea of rel relative and absolute paths. There's one gotcha that I know that has to do with the way the slashes are handled between Mac and PC. So if you're on a PC, on a PC, you're going to have to put your slashes slightly different to be able to navigate to the folders appropriately. I don't know enough about that because I use I use Macs, <laughs> but I know on, in PC world you're going to have to use slashes in a somewhat unintuitive way. That's my understanding. Yeah, for PCs, like just like you mentioned, Windows. If you copy your path and paste it, this is the way. The way it is uh, on what you are sharing. Um, that's how it is. But R doesn't read it that way. It won't run. I think there is, I yeah. forgot it now, but there was a time I came across. I think if you if you double the, the forward slashes, it will uh -huh. run. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but if you don't, um, I mean, 
I'm, I, at times you, I just see some people do some stuff in R and I wonder how they do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so what we're saying here is basically these window paths, if you copy this straight from your windows file system, it's not going to run without you manipulating those slashes because R expects it in a very specific way. And so you got to jump through a little hoop there if you expect to just copy and paste from, from the file system. Another reason, another argument to avoid slashes and, and nested file systems whenever you can, you know, short of just some simple organization like, like you suggested. Yeah. Like Daniel suggested. Yeah. Yep. And, and this is, this just gets back to that idea of using an absolute path, especially when you think about sharing a, a, a notebook, a Quarto document or a markdown document, if you got an absolute path in there, it's not going to be very friendly for folks. They're going to have to modify it. And then here's the here package. Maybe I should turn this over to Daniel. You want to tell us more about this package? Because I haven't used it, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, so basically when you set up a project, that folder is your working directory. When your notebooks are inside, directly inside that folder, your working directory will be still that folder for the example here chapter six yeah. but if we but if dewey creates a subfolder inside chapter six called uh, notebooks right. and he puts his notebooks in that folder uh, when he runs code uh, it will not work because although in the console you can write get working directory and chapter six will appear as the working directory when notebooks are inside subfolders uh, they will internally i do not how consider that the working directory will be the subfolder they are they are in so yeah. this here package simply is to tell the system Although this notebook is in a subfolder, my working directory is this one, is here, is chapter six. So yeah. please map chapter six as the working directory. That's like the, the, this is just useful when you have notebooks inside a folder. If not, there's no need to use it. Okay, great. Any questions from folks on, on the here package? But there's a link to it here and you can... Uh... Read more about here, here. So, <laughs> this is, uh, so instead of like using ref like uh, references, like in the path, like saying data slash or uh, notebook slash whatever the file name, here you could just use this uh, function, I guess. Is yeah, that... it, it will be like from your notebook calling a file or mm -hmm. saving a file. So yeah. that will be like here, Mm -hmm. uh, let's suppose plots slash mm -hmm. name of the plot and it will be the working directory chapter six in this example mm -hmm. uh, it will read it directly you know okay mm -hmm. just a way to probably way to make your code clearer and uh, manage the directories without having to put 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 a lot of you know no uh, okay. complexity. i have a question so in the examples that Dewey and Daniel had described, assuming you have chapter six, which is mm -hmm. the, the, the main folder, mm -hmm. and within chapter six, you created another subfolder, which is notebook. Mm -hmm. So if I want to get to that, I need to run that air package, right? And put where you have directory, mm -hmm. would that oh. be where chapter six would be? Uh, no, the thing is, uh, for example, uh, right now we see we saw that this code is uh, is working for Dewey, but if Dewey put this file in the notebooks folder, it will not work. It will not run because it will not identify the path. So to make that path work, when the Quarto document it's in a subfolder you need to use here is not to access the Quarto notebooks, but so the Quarto notebooks can access 
can identify the relative path in the working directory. So, okay. so here I yeah. So try to run it there and, and so you can see see what I did. I put yeah. I put notebooks and inside notebooks I have the example here yeah. and we're going to try to run this and it's not going to be able to find. Sorry, we'll not find it. It won't but find. You, you yeah. write in the console. Get well, I didn't. Directory. Yeah, part of that is I didn't. Is it strange that it's still. Sorry, let me put that in the quarta. Yeah. Still not going to work, right? Uh, I guess so. so yeah, path. So good. there it says path does not exist, guide to cart, because it's looking inside notebooks, right? So so yeah. let's, let's, let's. Um, but, 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 but what, what tricked me for a long time is that if you put in the console, get working directory, it will appear chapter six as your working directory. So that kept me confused during 10 years until I found. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it really is. It, Cause it, so it, it says really the working, is, yeah. it says the working directory is chapter six. Yeah. And so you might say, why why can't this find it? Because the working director is chapter six. Yeah. But from the notebook's perspective, yes. the working director is here. That's it. So when you install here and then you write, uh, how is it? Is uh, read X, tan, tan, then here, open parenthesis. Yeah. And you close the last parenthesis. Yeah. So it, I, put, I put notebooks here, right? Or do I? No, no, no. It will read it directly from the from the folder outside so you can close that one should work now let's see okay uh... <laughs> oh I, I need to do library see oh, okay. <laughs> i installed the package i didn't put the library right so that should do it ça. then yeah. i found it right yeah. So it just tells you, you don't even have to specify, you see that all, you don't have to specify that you're in a in a child folder, but rather mm -hmm. you just say here, it knows to to use the uh, the true Git working directory rather than the Quartos mm -hmm. version of the Git working directory. Yeah, that's it. So yeah. if there are like two, two, two levels hierarchically up to like two levels of sub sub folders, it will read it with the air packet, right? Yeah, I think this here, uh, maps you directly to the working directory, whatever it is. In this case, it's chapter six. Right. And if you put the command, get working directory. So that package here will let your notebook to read that directory. And it doesn't it. matter how many levels. levels Perfect. You have. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it's a nice little allows you to organize your files into structures like you're, you're suggesting without having to, because the last thing I want to do is fiddle around with my working directories and stuff. I, I've seen my my classmates messing with it and I'm just like, oh my God, I'm glad I haven't <laughs> had to worry about this. For, for, for me, it happened because uh, when you have one to three notebooks is fine, but sometimes I work with 30, 40, 50, and yeah. you would like to organize them in subfolders in a more a structure way so yeah it makes sense years to to find this solution <laughs> yeah no it's perfect yeah it's a great it's great and you're not alone because they they obviously <laughs> included it in the slides so some other people <laughs> thought this was a good idea so yeah well you know i think in terms of uh we've been through all the slides and even though it was a pretty short chapter we uh, i managed to yak the whole time <laughs> <laughs> and and use up most of the time. To, any any other questions before we? Uh... I I have like a quick one. Uh, sure. So when we run this uh, QMD file uh, and share it with someone, let's say uh, you are uh, sort of uh, running like a lot of data and it's taking a lot of time. So mm -hmm. as soon as it's run, it doesn't matter. You can just share it or uh, how how does that work? Yeah. So so what I. What we always do is we use. Let me let me open one of my. Um, let me show you one of my uh, homeworks to illustrate it. I think would be helpful probably. So if I pull up, um, 
my week four project. So if you look at this, this quarto, you know, I put embed resources equal to true mm -hmm. and it's going to use a number of files. It may use PNGs. It may use file that it loads, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When I render this, I chose to render this as HTML. You can see that it's in the YAML here that it's formatted as HTML. But when I render this, mm -hmm. then by, by doing that embed resources in particular, you're able to create a fully independent HTML file that I can share with anyone. Mm -hmm. And they have all of my code that they can look at. They can have all of my output. They can cop copy and paste any of this code that they want to use. It should, you know, does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So does it like have, it, it's independent of how much uh, data you are processing, like say one gigabyte, yep. two gigabyte. So yeah. Okay. Yep. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because it's all all gets loaded. Yeah. It's pretty pretty cool. <laughs> makes yeah. makes sharing pretty pretty nice. I, you know, I, yeah. This is the, again. This is how we how we do it. Every one of our homeworks has to be submitted in this way. So mm -hmm. we we write our code and then we have to create a a shareable document in HTML format that that they can view and see our code and we can decide how to format and everything. But uh, so I mm -hmm. I try to. I try to tell a little bit of a story with the with the Quarto document, just like you would when you're sharing it, right? Because generally, if you're creating something sort of professional that you want to share with a third party, you want you want that third party to have everything they know need to understand what what's in this file, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that's sort of beyond uh, just this meeting, but it's uh, it's sort of tell the story about your data, the data you're using, your analysis, what you did, so that people can read it and kind of understand what okay. my homework assignments are sort of trivial things, right? Create a for loop to calculate the square root of one through five. <laughs> right? I mean, this is just like exercises for us to learn our, but <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right, let me, uh, let me put stop here in the meeting chat. I think that will give John what he 